I quit fast fashion for good in 2023, and here's what I've learned about myself. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. If it's your first time here, then hi, my name is Becca. I am someone with a penchant for beautiful things. I love luxury, <laughs> but my budget doesn't always love luxury. And I'm also interested in learning more about slow consumption, ethical consumption. I think those terms can be really slippery and sometimes confusing and sometimes unclear, though they do have a pragmatic purpose. That's something I'll talk about later on in the video. But really, I've been on sort of a journey myself over the past couple of years. And last year, behind the scenes, I set a hard goal for myself to not shop fast fashion. So I quit fast fashion last year for a year. I'm still quitting. <laughs> I haven't purchased anything fast fashion. So I thought I would talk a little bit about what I've learned, both about the industry, like the fashion industry and the garment making industry, and also about myself, what I've learned about myself, my personal style, my preferences, what happens when I take that kind of mass consumerism out of the equation, how does that change my relationship to style, to personal style, to things, to the industry, at large. Everything I'm talking about, by the way, will be timestamped and sort of grouped according to theme. I am gonna share some of my favorite things that have come across my way over the last year, but um, you'll see all of the resources and like citations linked below. So let's get into the video. At the beginning of 2023, I set out a few concrete goals for myself. And mind you, I am not um, a rules-oriented person. I actually find that the more rigid rules are, the less likely I am to follow them. It's just something I've learned about myself over the years. So my focus in all of this has been actually about harm reduction in my own personal choices. And the one steady rule, the one hard and fast rule that I did set for myself was no more fast fashion and we can talk about what that means in a little bit. My other goals were to find more slow fashion or sustainable brands, to learn more about pre-owned markets like platforms, Depop, Poshmark, all of that, and to kind of maybe start selling and buying on there, which I do browse. I haven't started selling anything yet. I don't think I'm quite there yet, but I, I have learned a lot about these different platforms. I had a couple of motivations specifically to stop fast fashion shopping, and a lot of it was around consumption and just the mass amount of consumption and following trends and the way it wasn't making me feel good. The second reason was around the environment and just questioning the environmental impact of the way we consume fashion and clothing. And this also applies to beauty as well. And the last question for me was the question around labor and the question around the kind of exploitation of garment workers that happens globally and domestically. And I'm based here in the US in Los Angeles. And I have to say up top that I'm not a specialist in any of these areas. I'm approaching this as a consumer, as just like a regular everyday person. I do think I'm more research oriented as someone who has a background in academia, but um, those are not my fields of expertise at all. So I'm kind of just approaching this as like an everyday person. One of the things I really struggled with and I think we all maybe struggle with is the question of like what is fast fashion it can look like a lot of things and I think those terms are really slippery but I did set out a few like broad guidelines for myself so I wanted to move away from mass retailers like Zara like H&M if you do even a cursory search of the way that they produce garments the way they exploit workers their environment their environmental impact and the way that they've actually worked to sort of like greenwash their own corporate narrative um, there's a lot of stuff out there. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff out there and I knew I wanted to move away from that. That also included some retailers that have had like a really big resurgence recently like Abercrombie and their rebrand and everything. So it's basically like a lot of retailers that I associate with like mall stores. What came up for me a lot is what comprises the fast in fast fashion. And it's about mass production, it's about quick production and turnaround and 
inevitably with that comes the exploitation of labor, the search for the cheapest labor possible, which means outsourcing often to poorer countries, and also the um, lack of quality in the clothing because the focus is on speed and mass rather than quality and production. I've been following content creators like Aja Barber and um, Lake in the Stylist. There are a few others that I'll link below that have helped me learn a lot about the way that especially in the global north and in the west, our clothing waste ends up in landfills in the global south or in other poorer countries. And I was really starting to think a little bit more about like the circularity of fashion and like the materials that we use period. Another challenge I came across is how to read through the greenwashing that corporations do. If you're not familiar with the term, which I'm sure many of you are, it's the way that corporations use the language of sustainability or recycling or anything green to kind of obscure the way that they operate or con to continue business as usual with this sort of shiny veneer of being sustainable while not actually maybe materially changing their impact and their practices. I've been following the good on you app on Instagram. I'll link that below. And that's been a really good resource for um, providing some sort of scale for reading through the greenwashing that brands do and also thinking about their actual impact and ways to measure that. And then finally, on just like a more personal note, I think, you know, I'm 33. So I am coming out of the style that I had in my 20s. And my lifestyle is changing. I'm changing. I'm at a point where I just want fewer, nicer things things, as Hannah likes to say, Hannah Louise Poston, but I also just want things that I feel connected to in my life and things that will last. I really have an appreciation for quality that I didn't have before. And I also feel like I'm going through like the first real transformation in my aesthetic self that I've gone through in my adult life. Like there was the me of my 20s, um, my college and 20s years where, you know, I was having fun. I was going out a lot more. I also developed, you know, a per professional wardrobe, but my life is really different now. I'm a freelance creative. I work from home and I'm really interested in discovering what is my personal style and voice. And I think I'm slowly getting closer to that version of myself. And it's a, it's a process that feels good because really it's about like, what is authentic to me. So here's what I've learned about myself in the last year of quitting fast fashion. The first thing I learned about myself in quitting fast fashion is that I bought fewer things and I actually spent way less money. Even though my items, like individual purchases were more expensive, the overall amount of money I spent was far less than I had spent the year before. I haven't done exact numbers, but I already just know, <laughs> just based on my spending habits, that I was spending way less. I think this speaks to kind of the trick of low priced items where we're buying lower cost items, but you're like, oh, it's only $20. I can get five of them. Where you're buying many cheap items. I mean, we see that all the time in like Sheen hauls and like the kind of TikTok culture around fashion consumption. It's like, oh, but I'm buying 20 things for $300. And it's like, well, did you really want those 20 things? I'm just at a point where I'm like, I don't want more things. I want things that I really like and that make me feel good. But when you're doing that every month, you're actually spending so much money in terms of an annual budget for clothing. So even though you think you're just buying a lot of $20 things, you end up spending hundreds of dollars on things that you kind of just feel lukewarm about and actually will end up tossing anyway, or things that won't last, period. Like, I feel like in my 20s, especially in my early 20s college years, I spent a lot of time just like running into Forever 21 for a going out top, remember the going out top, and then wearing it a couple times and you wash it and it shrinks immediately and the seams fray and then you like donate it and who knows where it goes after you donate it. It's just like an endless cycle of consuming things, amassing things, and then ending up having to like get rid of them and it doesn't feel good. And when you think about it, it's like, okay, you're gonna spend two to $300 a month on fast fashion items. Let's say you multiply that by a year. If it's $300, let's say, you're gonna spend $3,600 a year on dozens of items of clothing. 
and you may really, really love just a few of those things. I was really, really shocked at how much less I spent once I unsubscribed from all of the marketing emails, once I unfollowed any brands, um, I would actually block like certain brands on my own social media free feed because I didn't want to see their ads. And it actually opened up a whole other space, like just mental space for me to think about what are the kinds of brands that I'm interested in, even just on like a purely aesthetic and like craftsmanship level. I also actually went through a period of not shopping at all. I think last January to April, I hardly bought any clothing related items. And I will say one unique thing for me last year was that I got married or we had our wedding celebration that was, delayed from COVID, I've talked about it before, but we finally had our party. And so I was budgeting a lot for that. And the big ticket items that I did purchase were wedding related things. And I can maybe talk about that in a later video, like how I approached bridal styling and like the items that I picked because I did love what I picked. But because of that, I just didn't buy a lot of things. The second thing I learned is that I am redefining what personal style means to me. I've always been someone who's generally a minimalist, but I feel like I'm actually always towing the line between being a minimalist and also being someone who likes kind of eccentric things. Like I like eccentric pieces and accessories and statement items, but overall in my day-to-day -day life, I don't wear very like ornate outfits or accessories. I like outfits to generally be streamlined. I like kind of more androgynous, maybe even sometimes masculine silhouettes, but then occasionally I like an unexpected pop or like a really dramatic puffy silhouette like for dressing up or something like that. And so I think over the years I had consumed a lot of fashion that was very, um, or a lot of fashion content that felt very formulaic. Like the capsule wardrobe is a classic example of this, where I really admire the people that are like, let me make 20 outfits with 20 items. And I totally understand how for some people that actually helps you streamline your wardrobe, set up different outfits, create looks for each day or certain kinds of occasions. I have learned that that is not me. <laughs> and what actually ended up happening over, I would say the last like three-ish years is I developed a really, really minimal wardrobe of basics that I was really happy with. And I ended up sacrificing or losing what felt like my own personal style because there was so much content around formulaic dressing. I have some thoughts on like the whole movement around formulaic dressing and then the backlash of like maximalist dressing. I think it had a lot to do with like our general social political state. <laughs> I think there's a bit of like this need for order and this need for making sense or logic um, out of a very disordered time of like pandemic, political fracturing, all of that. Maybe that's like a Substack piece, all right. But um, obviously there has been since then a major backlash with extreme maximalist dressing, which I also love, like I love seeing it, but it's that's not me either. So I think what I'm calling my approach to fashion or dressing or personal style, rather than formulaic style is intuitive style. Um, it's not about rules, it's more about an organic connection to things, whether it's because I like them aesthetically, I feel connected to the craftsmanship or the aesthetic or how they were made. Um, it's more about being in touch with my relationship to the things themselves rather than creating like equations for what works for me. The third thing I learned is that it does take an investment of time and energy to learn about new brands, to resist the old temptations that are calling me, and to curate and develop a different kind of sense of personal style. The fact is, whenever you're moving against the main mainstream current of something like the mainstream current of fast fashion and fast consumption, it, it does take labor and it does take effort and it does take educating yourself to learn about other ways of being in the world and in this world, the fashion world. There were definitely some moments where I felt tempted and when 
I felt challenged. So um, a good example of this is Black Friday. Um, by Black Friday of last year, I had already quit fast fashion for like 11 months. So I, I hadn't even really been thinking about it, but then I was just swarmed by all of the marketing emails, the very, very steep discounts. I am at my heart a bargain hunter. I grew up in an immigrant family. I We grew up only shopping at like Ross and Marshalls and stuff. And so, um, yeah, I think when I see steep discounts, it's so tempting because there's this idea of getting more for less. I mean, that's literally, isn't that Ross's <laughs> slogan, more for less? Um, it's so seductive. And so during Black Friday, I kind of felt that old itch come back where I was like, ooh, I wanna get like a haul of like a lot of exciting, fun new things. Um, and I, I actually don't think I ended up doing any shopping. Oh, that's not true. I bought, um, two pairs of shoes. I bought Frida Salvador loafers, which I absolutely love. They're so high quality, stunning, beautifully made. Um, and then I bought some GH Bass uh, Mary Janes. They're these pink leather Mary Janes. They're so fun. Um, and those were considered purchases that had been on my wish list for a long time. So that's all to say, like those moments of discount shopping are very, very tempting. And it is kind of like, this um, stimulation, like this addiction to being stimulated in this very specific way. And shopping addiction is so real. Like I think it works in the same way as a lot of addictions where there's a high to it and you're getting a certain kind of like adrenaline rush. It's actually like physiological. So detaching from that process is a process in itself. Even though reimagining my relationship to things has been a process and it has been an investment of time and energy and labor, it's actually that exact investment that keeps me going. So the more I learn, for example, about sweatshop labor and like garment worker strikes in Bangladesh, or the more I'm following the news about these specific things, the more it humanizes the process. Like I actually, something really interesting I've learned is that every item of clothing, even if it's mass produced, even if it's fast fashion, is touched by human hands. There is no machine that exists to fully automate any kind of clothing production. And when you think about that, when you think about the fact that even the cheapest item of clothing that you buy for like on sale for a $10 t-shirt on sale is touched by a garment worker, you have to wonder how much is that garment worker really making? Learning about these processes and the kind of like material production of clothing has actually been really helpful for me to stay connected to the idea of clothing production and our relationship to fashion in a really grounded way. Not just this abstract like, oh, it's bad for the environment kind of way, but in a way that actually like anchors me to the clothing that I'm wearing. I've been following a lot of small designers and small creators that are making art, making wearable art, and trying to figure out how to make it more accessible to people. There are two primary critiques that I hear about slow fashion or ethical fashion. The first is that there's a claim that slow fashion is not financially accessible, that it's too expensive. And the second is that it's not size inclusive. And I think those are fair critiques that were true at one point um, and sometimes are true. Like that's, it's obviously slow fashion is still a, a burgeoning movement. When I look at a lot of fast fashion prices now, like Zara, for example, where I know people spend tons of money on hauls, those are not cheap prices. <laughs> like I can understand that argument maybe with like H&M or something, but um, yeah, I don't see that much of a difference between Zara prices and a lot of the smaller like slow fashion creators and designers that I follow. And I know that they're not as accessible. Maybe international shipping is a whole other thing. Like there are definitely caveats to all of this, but I think with a little bit of effort, you'll see that there are actually a lot of small designers that are trying to make slow fashion more accessible. There's also so much secondhand clothing. Um, truly, it's actually overwhelming. That's been one of the challenges 
challenges for me in navigating Poshmark and Depop and all of that is that how, how much stuff there is. <laughs> it's like a little bit overstimulating, which is a good problem to have because it means there are a lot of avenues for more accessible clothing. The second counter argument about slow fashion not being size inclusive, I think does hold some water. I do think that is changing. Again, it's changing slowly, but I'll include some um, plus size and size inclusive, like small designers that I've been following. Um, and I think there are, you know, people that see this gap in slow fashion and are working in their own little corners to try to make slow fashion and ethical fashion more accessible. And it is slow going, but these are structural changes that we're trying to see, right? Like as much as I'm talking about my individual decisions and my choices over the last year, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the structural inequities, the structural violences, <laughs> the structural like ecological extraction um, that we see on a global scale. So even though it is slow going, I find myself being more forgiving about that with slow fashion, knowing that they're working against the current of corporations that are constantly undercutting them, underselling them, stealing designs, all of the bad stuff, like they're doing it. So taken in totality, I know it can sound really overwhelming just because there's so much information out there. There's, it's so hard to tell, like there's no universal metric for like, is a brand doing good? But there are different resources that you can look at and sort of examine and use your own critical thinking. Two articles that have really motivated me. Um, there's one, I think that was published in The Atlantic last at the end of last year and it was about the quality of sweaters and the quality of knitwear going down so drastically in the last couple of decades they actually reference the sweater that harry is wearing in when harry met sally there's this like beautiful cable knit brown sweater i think and they talk about why clothing doesn't look like that anymore and it's a really good um, sort of zoomed in perspective on this one corner of fashion, which is knitwear, and the way that the quality has degraded so drastically over the last couple of decades. And it really, I love knitwear, so it really got me looking into cool knitwear designers. I really love Baba, influenced by Hannah. Um, there are a few other things that I'll link below, but it really got me thinking about like the craftsmanship of clothing and of things like knitwear that are so um, labor intensive. Another article that really impacted me, it was actually published in Vogue in 20, December, 2022. So it's been a little bit over a year since it was published, but they cited this um, study done by this Berlin think tank or something. And they basically concluded that if nothing were to change globally, like if we were not to produce more carbon emissions or any of that, um, we should still only consume five new items of clothing a year to not do further harm to the environment or something like that. I will link it below. But their basic metric, their conclusion was that you should not purchase more than five new items of clothing a year, which is a lot to think about considering the way that we consume. Again, my approach to all of this is harm reduction. I actually think that when you try to change too much at once, you often rebound and you get frustrated and you go back to your old habits because you just don't wanna think about it anymore. So I think implementing small changes while advocating for broader structural changes is really the way to go. But um, if you get really into these things like me, then absolutely go for it. So I do wanna take you through some of my favorite purchases of the last year or some of my most worn items. It's kind of a random scattering of things, but I feel like it's more about my relationship to each thing. Um, so let's get into some of my like fashion favorites, most worn items. I will link what I can below and I will also try to link to more secondhand things. So the first things that I want to share are actually two um, jewelry pieces that I purchased for my wedding, but I purchased them keeping in mind 
jewelry that I would want to continue wearing in my day-to-day -day life. The first pair I actually wore in a recent video and I got a lot of comments about them and they are the um, ABLE pearl strands. I'll link these below. They're absolutely stunning. ABLE is um, a small, small jewelry company. So um, you've got these long strands and then it's a, like a stud backing and then the backing itself has um, little strands attached to it. Obviously statement pearls are very much a trend right now, but I think I will love these forever. They're sculptural, they're such interesting pieces, they're a statement, but there's still a kind of like sleekness to them. And I purchased these knowing that they would be something that I would want to wear after the wedding. And that was a kind of guiding ethos in a lot of my like wedding styling um, purchases. The other earrings that I grabbed are by Completed Works. I think I've shared these on my channel before. So this is a new brand that I came across and they do these incredible sculptural pieces. I love the asymmetry of these. They look almost like string or threads. There's this organic feel and then they're accented by pearls. And I just love how interesting they are. Anytime I wear these, I get comments about them. And because I am fundamentally Mentally, like a basics person when it comes to my everyday outfits. Like I just like jeans and a t-shirt. I like the addition of sculptural or interesting statement jewelry that will pop against a more neutral outfit, even like what I'm doing here. So while these earrings are all kind of trend led in that they include pearls, Pearls are also kind of timeless. And I think I'm just generally caring less about trends and I'm more in tune with what feels good for me and what I like. And even though I like seeing fashion and what's and keeping up with what's going on in fashion, it's less about incorporating the hottest new trends or whatever and more about kind of finding my own personal voice and style and like curatorial voice within that. Probably my most worn clothing is loungewear because I do work from home. And a couple of years ago, I discovered this small brand called Laton, L-E-S-T-I-E-N, like the French way. Um, but they're an LA based brand. And I found them while shopping in person actually with Hannah, Hannah Louise Poston. And um, they make really beautiful loungewear <laughs> and like luxury sweatsuits. It's not astronomically priced, but it's certainly more than I had ever Ever spent at that point on loungewear. Um, they do go on sale very, very frequently at like Net-A-Porter, at Essence, like at all of the retailers. So I would say just wait for a seasonal sale. But I have, I think two, two or three, no, I have three different sweatsuits from them. One in like an acid green, one in this like terracotta clay. And then I have this like slightly tie dye, taupey beige sort of sweatsuit. And I have different cuts too. Like I have their hoodie, I have their um, quarter zip and they're all so beautifully made. It makes me feel chic and put together, even if I am just lounging at home. It's definitely the kind of thing where people say like, oh, invest in your basics, and I've invested in these basics, and they have held up beautifully. I've washed them hundreds of times. The colors themselves are so vibrant. They're all hand dyed in their factory downtown, and um, the draping is stunning. So every time I wear them, and if I'm like wearing them out, I always get questions about who makes it because you can see the difference, a huge difference in quality between my Laton sweatsuits and like my Nike sweatsuits. It's just night and day. And so even though I'm wearing something simple and basic, I feel like it's still interesting and there's still an element of style in them. Another favorite item that I purchased last year was this Mara Hoffman linen dress. And I purchased this for a wedding that I was attending. And this was a real lesson to me, um, something that I'm proud of in terms of incorporating a lesson. Too many times in my life I have bought a, an item of clothing, specifically a dress for a wedding or a special occasion because I need something in a pinch and I run into a store, I make an impulse decision, I wear it once and then I never wear it again. And I really, really, really hate that feeling. I never wanna do that again. Um, and I do have a couple of pieces, a couple of dresses and formal wear things that go with a lot of different occasions, but I 
did want something new. So I found this dress on sale on Mara Hoffman and I really love Mara Hoffman's designs. Um, it's not as loud and punchy as some of her other prints and like the colorful designs that she's known for, but it felt like me. It felt like a way of, um, I don't know, having my little taste of Mara Hoffman while still staying true to me. So it's a black linen dress with puff sleeves. It has um, some cutouts, which I wasn't sure about because cutouts can be very trendy, but um, it still felt sleek and classic enough where I could wear it to a lot of different occasions. And this was a slightly less formal wedding. It was outdoors, it was in the mountains, it was really beautiful. And when I was picking this dress, I wanted something that I could both dress up and dress down. So I can actually wear this, and I have worn this, with like a white fisherman sandal. And it's a dress that feels, I mean, it's still a statement, it's a nice dress, but it's something I could wear out to a casual dinner or to brunch, or I could style it with heels and nice jewelry and some more formal makeup, like a nice beaded clutch, and it could be an evening outfit in the summer. It is linen, so it's like a summer outfit, but um, I would be perfectly happy dressing it up that way as well. And I think the accessories are really key with a dress like this, where it's a silhouette or a fabric that you can dress up or down. Um, the accessories really, really set the tone. I think Mara Hoffman's been doing um, more sustainable or ethical fashion for a long time. And I'm seeing a lot of other designers do this where they actually have resale options or like more circular market options on their own website. So if you go to Mara Hoffman's website, you'll see that um, there's a secondhand option for Mara Hoffman clothing from past seasons, which I think is really cool. You can tell I'm very much an accessory person and another accessory or handbag that was one of my most used in the last year is the Acne Misubi bag. So this is their mini size. There's a size smaller than this that's micro. They have micro, mini, medium, and large, I think. And the medium and large are shoulder bags and they're very big. They're really beautiful. Um, I purchased this, I think, uh, in 2022. So I've had this now for almost two years, I would say. And it almost looks brand new, like for a white bag, except for a couple spots where I think there's some foundation <laughs> that stains the bag, which is entirely my fault. But for a white bag, um, it's held up beautifully. It hasn't cracked anywhere. Um, even the bottom of the bag, I don't set my bag on the ground very much, but even the bottom of the bag is in beautiful shape. The reason I was originally attracted to this, let me take off the scarf actually. It has the clean lines of like Danish design, but then they incorporate this beautiful knot, which is inspired I think by like a Japanese OB sash knot. Um, and you can carry it as a bucket bag just with the top handle and remove the strap or you can wear it on your shoulder or you can wear it crossbody. For me, this bag is pragmatic. It is functional. It actually holds so much stuff. Like I can put in my phone, a little makeup bag, my wallet, my keys, even a small water bottle. Like it actually holds a ton of stuff and it's an understated statement. <laughs> so I feel like it, it's a bag that does catch your eye because it's white and because of the sculptural quality of it. It has this beautiful like gold hardware. Um, it does catch your eye, but it's still very much a neutral. Like it's actually a bag that I can wear with almost any outfit because it is white and white is a statement neutral. And it's a bag that I can wear during the day or in the evening. I did purchase that bag new. Um, though I was able to get it discounted. I think they've raised their prices quite a bit, just like everyone has, but I feel like when I got this bag, it was like $1,000 USD. I got it for cheaper than that, but um, I feel like now this bag is like 12 or 1300. So of course, like everyone else, the prices are going up. And I think Acne Studios in general is just becoming more popular. So they're able to do that. But there are a ton of secondhand options with the Misubi bag. It's also a bag that like, people know if you're into fashion, if you're into Acne Studios, but it's not one of those like, it girl bags where it feels so trendy. I do get comments about it, but I've only had like a handful of people come up to me who know what the bag is. And I kind of like that. I'm not like 
I don't want like flashy designer things necessarily. Um, I like the understated quality of that. And the last like most worn accessories are my sunglasses. So I have two pairs. The first pair are my Gentle Monster sunglasses and I picked them up um, last February, I wanna say, um, in Seoul, where they're a lot cheaper. If you're in Korea, Gentle Monster is a Korean brand, um, so it's like half the price there. <laughs> but they do have stores in LA and in New York if you wanted to see them in person. Um, the thing about Gentle Monster sunglasses, this is actually my second pair, is that the quality is amazing, and they're designed with a low nose bridge in mind. These are the sunglasses. I don't remember what they're called, but I will link them in the video. I actually have also um, <laughs> these little stickers on them. They're from this brand called Pretty Britty. This is totally a tangent, but they make sunglasses stickers so that they don't smudge your um, makeup when you put them on. They're brilliant. I'll link them below. They also come in black, but I just have white ones on. Um, even though colored lenses, I think are a trend, these feel neutral enough to me. Like it's not so bright. It's not like a yellow or a blue where, um, it still feels like it's something that I can wear all the time. And to me, sunglasses are a very worthy investment because they protect your eyes. I also live in Southern California and I drive a lot. I'm in LA, lots of time spent in traffic. So it's a very much a worthy investment and something I wear almost every single day. The other sunglasses were um, my one like luxury purchase, I think of the last year, and they're my Loewe sunglasses. And these are much more of a statement. So these are their square anagram sunglasses. They look like this and they've got the Loewe anagram here. These come in a lot of different colors. I think they come in um, black, they come in like a white, and they come in colors as well, I wanna say. These are not very nose, low nose bridge friendly. I do sometimes add these little like uh, stickers, like nose pad stickers to prevent them sliding down, but they do kind of touch the tops of my cheeks a little bit, especially when I'm smiling because I have really round cheeks. So here's what they look like on. As you can tell, I like a square frame. I have a rounder face, so I think it just works for me. These are much heavier. They're much more of a statement, but they're still neutral. I love tortoise shell because it gives you like a textural variation while still being very neutral. And I think a warm brown tortoise shell just looks good on my skin tone and my hair color and all of that. But um, these are my most, probably two most worn fashion items, period, because I wear them almost every single day, one or the other when I'm driving and when I'm out and about. Obviously, Loewe is like really having a moment and I'm happy about that. I think they do really cool, interesting, like funky designs, but sunglasses are a nice way to get that taste of luxury without committing to like the full expense of a bag or something like that. Um, and also the secondhand market is always flooded with secondhand designer sunglasses. So there really is no need to even like shop for a new pair of sunglasses. It's something I've been really surprised by as I've been browsing Poshmark and stuff more is how many brand new items are being resold with tags um, that have never been worn. It's actually kind of shocking and really speaks to the way that people consume and, and over consume. The last thing I'll say is that I'm really trying to navigate these questions um, of sustainability, of labor, of ethical practices around beauty. And I think it's a lot more difficult with beauty for a few different reasons. Beauty products expire, so there is naturally a faster rate of turnover than with clothing, which you can have clothing items for your whole life that will still be good if they're well made. Um, not true with beauty. So there is a higher rate of disposability. The other thing that I think is trickier is that it's much more difficult to figure out how raw materials are sourced, where they're sourced, the labor um, in terms of like where they're made, different factories. One item can be made in Los Angeles, but it can have ingredients that come from all over the world and there's no traceability for the consumer. And so I think it poses its own unique 
unique set of questions and challenges. The obvious answer is simply to consume less. <laughs> and I think that's an answer that not a lot of us wanna hear. There's been such a huge growth and acceleration of the beauty industry that's led by trend and like social media trends and TikTok trends. And also because of that, there's just been a huge growth of the beauty industry in general. And of course, all of that simply leads to more waste and oftentimes waste that is not recyclable or biodegradable. So these are all questions I'm navigating myself and I don't have a roadmap for it. Um, it's a tension that I think I walk as a creator of wanting to be thoughtful and um, critical, like a critical thinker in navigating all of this, but also being someone who loves beauty. And this is also my job. So I don't have all the answers, but these are some of the tensions that I think are productive and are worth asking and that I want to continue asking here. So all of that said, I hope you guys enjoyed. I know I just blabbed your ear off, but something I've realized in thinking about this behind the scenes is that I don't have to have all of the answers to create content around this. I obviously have a lot of questions, a lot of things I wanna say, and I think you do too. Like in my DMs, any of my question boxes that I've put up, I always get a huge response when I'm engaging with you guys about questions around slow consumption. So if it's your first time here, I hope you'll subscribe. If it's not your first time, I hope you will come back for my fashion content and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.